Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Monday, May 22nd, 2023. I'm delighted to be here with Professor Stephen Quake. Steve, it's great to be with you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Great to be here. Steve, to start, I know this is going to be a mouthful, but would you tell me, please, all of your titles and institutional affiliations? <laughs> I am the head of science at the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative and the Lee Otteson Professor of Bioengineering and Applied Physics at Stanford University. All right, and so former Caltech professor. <laughs> former Cal of course, that's what brings us together. Let's start with the, 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 the named the endowed professorship. Who is or was Lee Otterson? Lee Otterson um, was a son of farmers from Calusa um, in California, uh, in the sort of uh, northeastern part of the state. Came to Stanford as an undergrad during the Depression um, and uh, uh, got his degree here and was very grateful because in the Depression, if you maintain a minimum of, I forget it was, a B or a C average, Stanford would defer your tuition payments for some time. Um, that deferred tuition is what let him get through. Um, and then he became a successful entrepreneur, businessman, did things in the aerospace industry and other things and, uh, and made a gift to Stanford. Lovely, lovely gentleman. I got to meet him towards the end of his life. Steve, were you present at the creation for the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub? Were you there at the, as, as these things were getting planned out? Yes, I was the founding co-president of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, which was Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan's first real effort in science philanthropy. Um, and uh, so we helped plan that and launched it my, with my partner, Joe DeRisi, who's a professor at UCSF. What was exciting to you about being a part of the initiative? Well, it was a chance to, uh, uh, you know, do something big for science in our area. So it was a regional scientific um, organization. I, you know, going back to my Caltech days when I was coming up as assistant professor, my senior colleagues all looked out for me, um, went out of their way to do nice things for me and, you know, help me get started. And, you know, I very grateful. I was very grateful for that. And this was a chance for me to give back to my colleagues in science um, uh, here here up in the Bay Area, um, and also to take on a really big problem. Uh, you know, my research, starting from things that had begun at Caltech, in fact, had gotten me to the point of trying to take on some inspiring big projects, like building a cell atlas of all the cell types in the human body, and I knew I couldn't do it alone. It would need resources and large collaborations, and this became a vehicle to do that. How do you incorporate your research agenda at Stanford with all the exciting things that are happening at the Biohub? Well, some of it is very synergistic. And so my, my students and postdocs have played a large role in coordinating our cell atlas efforts, but I also work on things that are totally orthogonal and not connected to the biohub and are just of personal scientific interest. So it's a mix. And how much administrative responsibilities are there for you in this role? Well, a lot now as head of science. It's a big job. Um, it's, uh, you know, CCI has uh, a very large endowment. It's it's larger even than the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and larger than all but five universities. And so um, there's a lot of resources being put to work for science. And that's now globally around the world, not just in the Bay Area. Do you see CZI as playing synergistically with the larger biotechnology effort in Northern California? Absolutely. We're already seeing the first sorts of things spinning out into small companies and making their way, hopefully, into the clinic to help patients. So is this to say that drug delivery and dealing with the FDA, is that sort of the bread and butter of what the CZI is all about? Not at all. I mean, we're really focused on basic science. And, you know, we want to see our discoveries taken in the clinic by professionals. And we deal with that the same way universities do. We license intellectual property and, um, and, and help, uh, help independent companies get access to the technology. And they have to then raise the money to get into the clinic. Steve, some overall questions before we go and develop your personal uh, narrative in a chronological sense. Fundamental research and, and translational research. Do you keep those worlds separate? Is it all combined for you? How do you determine when it's all about just figuring out how nature works? And when is it that you have a specific translational goal in mind? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a great question. And I love this quote from Pasteur. Um, let me try to look it up so I get it right, since we're doing this for posterity. Um, fruit of the tree. One of my postdocs, who I met at Caltech, 
um, and then came with me to Stanford, made me aware of this quote um, from Pasteur, uh, there does not exist a category of science to which one can give the name applied sciences. There are sciences and the applications of science bound together as the fruit of the tree which bears it. I think that's very nice. Um, it's all a continuum. Why does it speak to you? <laughs> because that's consistent with my own experience. Um, you know, it's, it's it, they're not a real hard and fast distinction. They're two sides of the same coin. I mean, a lot of my work at Caltech was developing new technologies for measurement in science, which were used by me and others to ask both very basic questions in science, but also to develop applications relevant for human health. Your work in diagnostics and measuring tools for biology, do you see that as a, as a new era courtesy of, of all of the advances in technology and computation? Are you doing something that's different or more of a continuation from what, for example, Lee Hood was doing in the 70s and 80s? Yeah. Um, so Lee's one of my heroes. And, you know, it, uh, another interesting Caltech story. Somehow, uh, he was at Caltech before me. We didn't overlap there, um, but I, I know him very well. And uh, uh, my lab, lab telephone number at Caltech, I inherited his lab telephone number. So every now and then the phone would ring. It was someone looking for Lee or someone in his lab, <laughs> um, which was very nice. Um, and, you know, Lee, one of the great pioneers um, of, of uh biomedical technology development, the idea of automating DNA sequencers and protein sequencers and DNA synthesizers. He played such an important role in that and, um, you know, driving those technologies to the point where they could be used to sequence genomes. Um, you know, he was there from the very early days and was visionary about it. Um, and there, I think the driving motivation was really to understand genetics by getting the genome. Um, and, uh, and that's all come to pass. He was correct as a visionary about that. Um, now, my own contributions have been different. It's been less about using the sequencers to sequence genomes and more about using them to count molecules. Um, and by counting molecules, that's opened the door to a whole uh, set of blood tests that replace invasive biopsies, MIPT to replace amniocentesis, um, blood tests to replace invasive biopsies for transplant patients, um, blood tests to replace biopsies for deep infectious disease. Those are all now in the clinic based on the work that my group has done. Um, and, you know, I do view it as a real turning point in diagnostics, that this idea that blood tests can replace invasive biopsies. It's um, important both for patient safety and for equity, health equity, and making sure that the fruits of the genome revolution are shared equally. Because there's, you know, very small number of hospitals, relatively speaking, that have, you know, physicians with the skill to do biopsies and do it very well on the cutting edge. But blood can be drawn anywhere and mailed to a lab to be tested. And so um, that for me is the great, you know, leveling value of these genomic technologies is they, they're available to everybody with a simple blood draw that can be sent to a lab and, you know, doesn't matter where you live, um, rural, urban, anywhere, you can have the benefit of these technologies and the tests that flow from them. Steve, if I understand correctly, all of your formal academic training is in physics and math, and yet your career trajectory is so squarely rooted in biology. Was that the plan from the beginning? Did you understand that you wanted physics as an intellectual foundation and then go into biology? Not from the beginning. Um, you know, like a lot of people in their early student careers, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had a lot of interests. And I was chasing different things. And when I got to graduate school, uh, in my first year of graduate school, I spent the whole year kind of systematically looking across physics, trying to figure out where was the most exciting part of physics to, to do research in. And I kind of got onto this idea that this interface between physics and biology would be very interesting. And so it was there in the early part of graduate school where I kind of decided that's a direction that I want to follow. Now, did you have that epiphany before or after you, you met Steve Chu? After, because I had done my undergraduate thesis in Steve's lab, ah. working with optical tweezers and trying to pull on molecules. And so he had introduced me to some of these ideas in biophysics and gotten me interested in the field for sure. But I thought I was going to do something totally different for graduate school. I was going to change direction. 
And, you know, I thought about that, then did the survey and realized, you know, Steve was really onto something and that he wasn't steering me wrong. Let's put it that way. Based on all the things you've worked on and your academic pedigree, is biophysics as a combination of biology and physics the best way to describe what you do and what you're after? I think it is, yes. Has that term changed over the course of your career? Does it mean something different now than it might have 20 or 30 years ago? I think it does. Yeah, it has changed. And, you know, there was a period when biophysics was just about, like, human performance, how you hit a basketball, how you hit a baseball the furthest, how you make a basketball shot. Um, it was about how bacteria swim and how fish swim and animals move and that kind of stuff, very sort of mechanical, fluid mechanics, that sort of thing. And, you know, it wasn't really molecular for a long time. Um, and the physicists who were interested in molecular biology became biologists, right? I mean, that's what Seymour Benzer did, right? I mean, he was a physicist, began working on phage and then got into behavioral genetics, but he just completely gave up on physics. They don't think about him as a physicist anymore, but he was um, another great Caltech you know, person back in the day. Um, uh, Max Delbruck, same thing, another Caltech person. Those people in that cohort, um, they were physicists who became biologists and somehow they were forgotten about in the physics community. And it wasn't called biophysics, they just called it biology. Molecular biology was a new field. Um, and so that was just biology. And the folks who were doing biophysics, it was, you know, not molecular, not as interesting. And that went through a whole transition. Now the physicists have discovered that molecules are interesting in biology and they should be studying them. And, you know, there's a whole discipline to it. And, you know, one of the real eloquent um, leaders of that movement, Rob Phillips at Caltech, who's written several books about this, Physical Biology of the Cell, um, being one of them, Cell Biology by the Numbers. And, uh, you know, there's now, uh, I think, a great community right on the boundary between the disciplines that's exploring a very interesting space. Steve, you're well positioned to comment on some of the similarities and differences of startup culture or the culture of tech transfer as both a previous Caltech professor and now a Stanford professor. What are some of those similarities and differences when you have inspiration to bring an idea possibly to market? Well, you know, again, you know, I have to say, going back to my Caltech experience, Larry Gilbert, who ran the Office of Technology Licensing at Caltech, was a real mentor to me, mm -hmm. um, as he was to many other faculty at Caltech. And, you know, he when he took over, Caltech was not a big player on the technology licensing area. By the time he retired, by the time I left, which is just before he retired, Caltech was getting more patents than any other university except for the UC system as a whole. Um, that's not per capita. That was total number of patents per year. He did an amazing job. And you know, part of what he did was he just went around and visited all the faculty. He'd go in, sit in their office, say, what are you working on? What's got you excited? What's your latest big paper? And they'd tell him, and he'd say, well, have you thought about filing a patent on that discovery? <laughs> and uh, they'd often say, no, tell me about that. And he'd explain to them how it all worked. And you know, he really built up uh, a very vigorous program and sort of taught a whole generation of faculty how to think about how their research world intersected with, you know, things being developed commercially. And, you know, I learned a ton from them along those lines, for sure. Steve, some questions about mentoring undergraduates and graduate students. What opportunities do you have to interact with Stanford undergraduates? You know, quite a bit. Um, I, uh, you know, the first part of my tenure here, I taught a lot. We started a new department. I was teaching undergraduate classes. Since I've taken over these leadership opportunities, I'm not teaching um, in class as much, but I'm still mentoring in the lab. And, uh, you know, I have undergraduates come through to do internships. Um, one just started today, actually, um, young woman from Columbia University, but there'll be a couple Stanford ones coming through too. And I know that your your lab is, is so dynamic. It's filled with so many graduate students and postdocs doing such exciting things. What are the kinds of things that attract graduate students and postdocs to your lab? Um. Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I collect oddballs, <clears throat> people who want to challenge. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I've got a little bit of a reputation as a challenging person with very high standards, and that doesn't appeal to everybody. So there's a little filter, I think, of people who come in, people who want to challenge and, you know, really want to strive and, and 
um, do science at the very highest level. And if they want to do that, they find a home in my lab. And based on your own academic trajectory, are our graduate students just as likely to come in with undergraduate degrees in physics, chemistry, and biology? All over the map, absolutely. It's a very interdisciplinary group. That's part of the fun. What about, and this is perhaps a generational question, computational skills. Are you learning the way to utilize computers in some sense from your graduate students these days? Oh yeah, I mean, it's uh, the things we do are very heavily computational, um, require some computational savvy, and um, you know, everybody in the lab learns how to do experiment and computation. Um, that's part of what I believe is that, you know, I don't try to get specialists in the lab. I try to teach everyone have an experiment from start to finish, or they got to be able to do the bench work and do the computational analysis and write the paper. That's, I think, the best path to independence for them um, if they're going to set up their own labs someday. Um, and yes, they all have far surpassed me in uh, computational sophistication. Now, on that point, we're all thinking about AI these days. Has your lab embraced AI? Do you see the benefits and perhaps the pitfalls of AI for the science that you do? Yeah, I was a skeptic for a long time, but now I'm a believer. I mean, we've really crossed the threshold of these large language models, um, both the analysis of DNA sequences, but also in tools like ChatGPT, which you know, my students are doing all kinds of creative things with to uh, try to synthesize scientific knowledge and apply it to, to research questions. What's an example for people who are concerned about what AI might do in science specifically that you might counter with this newly found positive assessment? Well, um, you know, one is how you do annotation. So I mentioned we're trying to make these cell atlases. Um, maybe I mentioned, I can't remember. Did I mention that? Um, we're trying to make atlases of all the cell types of the human body. That was our big biohub project. And, uh, you know, once you've described them at a molecular level, you need to give them names and kind of annotate what you think their function is based on your knowledge of the various genes they're expressing. And that's been a very labor-intensive task. Um, we have expert humans do it. Um, that's not fully scalable. Um, and so one of my students um, has been teaching chat GPT to annotate. Um, and that's a very exciting project. I think we're going to be using it um, at some point in the near future. Steve, are you involved in any policy initiatives, either at the state or the federal level? Uh, not directly at this point, no. What have you learned about the regulatory framework in bringing all of your, your, your products to market? Um, you know, I, it's, uh, I think, largely well thought out. Um, and, you know, designed to protect the safety of people. Um, and uh, that's super important. Um, in its specific implementation, there's often areas where, you know, one wishes it could be uh, a little faster or quicker. But in general, um, you know, I think it's a positive thing and generally well executed by people who are well-meaning and have the best interests of, of the country in mind. Just as a snapshot in time, what are you working on currently? What are some of the big projects in your lab? Yeah, um, well, we're on our second generation of Tabula Sapiens, which is our big human cell atlas project, and we're preparing a paper for that. Now we have a million cells from various donors that uh, characterize hundreds of cell types from two dozen organs in the human body. Um, we're looking a lot at non-model organisms. Um, we made an atlas of the fly and then looked at flies, how they age. And we're trying to compare that with earlier work we did with mice and how they're aging and sell atlas of that. So, you know, the model organisms are again, um, you know, incredibly informative and providing so much. And, you know, um, another Caltech connection, right? I mean, wasn't it Sturdivant who was, you know, brought the fly thing to Caltech? Yes. Yes. Um, and, you know, it, uh, it continues to be such a powerful organism to help us understand biology, for sure. Well, Steve, let's go all the way back to the beginning, develop your family roots. Let's start with your parents. Tell me a little bit about them and where they're from. Yeah, my parents um, are both first-generation college students, actually. Uh, my mom is an immigrant. Her family immigrated to the U.S. from Germany when she was 12. Uh, they were... Uh, displaced people. Um, the part of Germany where they lived in was given to Poland after the war. And so they were thrown off the family farm and you know, sort of had no place to go. Uh, and eventually were sponsored to come here, lived in, moved to a farm in upstate New York. Um, my dad 
is born in the U.S., but the child of an immigrant and also from Germany. He also grew up on a farm upstate New York, um, also a first-generation college student. And uh, um, that's where uh, they met and married. And I was born in Schenectady, and we lived there until I was 12, after which we moved to suburban Connecticut, just outside of New York City. Did your parents speak to each other in German? They did not. Um, you know, and it's something I regret. I mean, in those days, it was tough being a German in this country. There were still a lot of bad feelings after the war, and there was strong pressure to assimilate. Um, and uh, and and they, I think, felt it might be a burden for their kids to be called out different in German. That probably was challenging for them when they were younger. What was your father's profession? Um, <clears throat> so he was an early software entrepreneur. Um, and... Uh, uh, started a couple of companies that were successful and, um, you know, that's where I got my entrepreneuring genes from, I think, and the experience. And, uh, another funny story, um, I gotta look this up. Uh, so his first company was called Bibliographic Retrieval Services. It was an early online database where they indexed all books in print, all patents, all New York Times article, um, and so forth. They would sell that service to libraries, university libraries. And you know you go look things up, and when I and he sold that company, um, and I'm trying to figure out who he sold it to, um, because when I started at Caltech and went to the library and logged in to do his literature search, his screen showed up. Caltech was using the company that acquired his company. Oh, that's awesome. The page was still there. Um, It was amazing. Um, I told him that he was so proud. Did your mom work outside the home? She was a high school teacher um, until the family started, and and then she uh, raised us. Now, the move from New York to Connecticut, was that a business opportunity for your father? Yeah, it was when my dad sold BRS, and he went to go work for the parent company. um, And uh, did that for a few years, then started another company. So what years, how old were you when when the family moved to Connecticut? Um, I was 12. Yeah, I was born in 1969, so we can do the math on that. Were you always interested in science? Did you know you wanted to pursue physics in, in college? You know, I uh, I was interested in science, but I was also, you know, in that generation of, of, uh, of people when the personal computer revolution was happening. I mean, duh, my dad was working with big systems, and, you know, I was just fascinated by computers, what was going on in Silicon Valley, and so I thought I have a career somewhere between computers and science and, you know, I'm interested broadly in that. When it was time to think about college, where did you apply? What was it within range? Well, um, you know, my parents um, really valued education. And so them having been the first in their families to go to college, they were sort of, and then they did well, I mean, became middle class. And so a lot of value placed on education. And from a very young age, they told both me and my brother that they put aside money for us to go to college, wherever we could get into. And they had um, basically, you know, been very frugal and careful saving money from the time we were born so that uh, we could um, go anywhere that would take us. Um, and that was a very reassuring feeling. So did you apply mostly close to home or did you know you wanted to uh, have a cross-country adventure? No, I was... Uh, I was applying all over the country. Um, Let's see, what was it? MIT, Princeton, Amherst, Stanford, Harvey Mudd. What was the winning consideration for you? Um, Well, California, Silicon Valley. Yeah, that's sort of what it was. So Silicon Valley, even in the late 80s and early 90s, that was an exciting prospect for you. Oh, yeah, for sure. Do you remember what was happening in computers around that time? What, what, what would have been alluring? Oh, my gosh. I was reading all the trade rags. I mean, our, our first computer at home was an Atari 800. Um, and then, you know, I learned to program on that. One of my buddies and I started a computer camp together, and we bought an Apple IIe, and we were teaching all the neighborhood kids on these computers. That was the thing. You know, it was floppy disks and... Different world from what it is today. Now, how did you focus on physics as an undergraduate? What was the thinking there? 
So when I went to high school, I was accepted into the Columbia University Saturday Science Program. Um, they had a program every Saturday where kids could come in and take courses. And one of the courses I took in that was in physics. I was super interested in it. And I, at that point in time, somehow stumbled onto Feynman's book, um, uh, the, the, the autobiography. Um, what is it? What do you care what other people think? Yeah. I read that and I, he really resonated with me. I, 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 you know, I love the spirit of it and, you know, it was very inspiring. And so he became one of my heroes. How did you meet Steve Chu as an undergrad? He taught freshman physics. I took the spring, spring quarter of freshman physics with modern physics I took from him and it was super inspiring. He's a really dynamic guy. Oh yeah, for sure. And did that lead directly to your, the opportunity to work in his lab? Yeah, when it came time to do an honors thesis, um, I remember the things he talked about in his lab. And he'd take us on a lab tour at the end of the class. And I said, I think I want to do that. And so I went and asked him if he'd mentor me, and he agreed. How much biology did you take as a college student? None. Wow. Last biology course I took was in high school. <laughs> That's amazing. And you appreciated know. from Steve Chu and his lab the value of a physics perspective in biology questions? Absolutely. Absolutely. Those were the early days of trying to measure molecular mechanics and, you know, use optical tweezers to measure forces on molecules, stretching DNA. That's what I worked on. But also he was working with Jim Spudich on measuring myosin, stepping forces and things like that. I wonder if you, you could explain what exactly does optical tweezers mean? Yeah. So it's a way to use radiation pressure to trap macroscopic objects. And um, it turns out that if you take a laser beam and focus it to a point, that focal point where the, the fields are the highest um, will become uh, uh, a stable trap for any dielectric particle, like a glass bead or a polystyrene bead. They just, you can work out the forces on it. There's a bunch of ways to explain it. Easiest way is through dipole forces. Um, but it's it ends up being a great way to trap particles and you can, then by manipulating a laser beam, move them around and apply forces and so forth. And so if you then take those little micron sized beads and use them as handles, you can pull on molecules. So you use biochemistry to glue the beads to the ends of molecules, and then you can measure forces on molecules. From that experience, did you have well-formed ideas about whether you'd be a, more on the experimental side or the theoretical side? Oh, I went back and forth for several years. Now, your interest in computers, it's early, of course, but looking back on your college days, could you see the roots of the of the dot com boost that boom that would come a few years later? Well, I started in graduate school. Um, you know, I still remember the, in Oxford, the, the, the computer room was in the basement of the theory building. And it was a tiny little room with a couple of sun workstations in it. And somebody showed me the uh, the Mosaic browser from University of Illinois and what it did. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. And this is gonna be something big at some point. Um, and that was my first introduction to the World Wide Web. Um, and when I was a, back at Stanford um, as a postdoc, you know, Yahoo, things like that, Google, all that was starting and these search engines were becoming very powerful. I began to use them a lot. You know, I, I could see they were useful and um, and began to incorporate it in my daily work. Did you stay at Stanford during the summers or you went back home? When I was an undergrad? Yeah. Um, I had a series of summer jobs. So, you know, one summer I worked at IBM Yorktown. Another summer I worked at Yale. Um, one summer I stayed at Stanford to work in Steve's lab. It was a mixture of things. When did you decide that you wanted to go on to a science career, to go on to graduate school in physics? You know, I had very inspiring teachers my freshman year in both physics and math, and I realized, you know, hey, I can do this stuff. Um, and so it was probably my sophomore year in college that I began to think, yeah, it's going to be science and not computers. How did the opportunity come to, to study at Oxford? Uh, I had a Marshall scholarship. Um, and so uh, I, I never had a chance to do a semester abroad as an undergraduate because the curriculum is so regimented. You can't get out of step with the sequences. And I 
thought, okay, I'll do it after I graduate. And I began looking for ways to pay for it. I began applying for fellowships and uh, was offered the Marshall. What were your impressions when you arrived at Oxford, perhaps starting on a cultural level? Well, there's this great Oscar Wilde quote about England and the United States being two countries divided by a common language. <laughs> right. uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, you know, there's a temptation to assume just because we have a similar language, everything else is the same, but it's not, and it's deceptive, and it takes a little while, but boy, then it is a shock. And you understand culture shock, maybe more so than a place where the language is different, because you don't have the expectation that it's the same. But uh, yeah, I mean, definitely it's a different culture, and, you know, it gave me a great perspective on where I came from. You know, you start to look at the United States as an outsider would, and you realize how arbitrary a lot of the societal decisions and conventions are um, that you always sort of never question. Um, and it puts you in a position to question some of those things. You mentioned previously as an undergrad oscillating between experiment and theory. Were you focused on theory by the time you arrived at Oxford or you were still figuring that out? Yeah, I was in the theory department. Um, and so that's where I was, you know, sort of destined. But after that first year, I decided I wanted to go back and do some experiments. So I went back to Steve's lab Second year of my graduate work I did at Stanford with Steve, then I went back to Oxford to finish the theory part in my third year. Who was your advisor at Oxford? A fellow named Robin Stinchcomb. And what was he known for? He, uh, a statistical physics renormalization group. Um, you know, super, super clever guy, great mentor, um, very generous person. What was the value of going back to Steve's lab at, at Stanford for your thesis? Because the things I was asking theoretically, you know, pointed directly to some experiments that one could do using optical tweezers and single molecules. I thought, I want to go do those experiments. I don't want someone else to do them for me. Uh, and, and so uh, I wanted to be doing both at that point, the theory and the experiment. What was the overriding uh, science question that drove your thesis? So the, the most interesting part of the thesis was to ask what happens when polymers get tied into knots. I was interested in this intersection of topology and statistical mechanics, because <clears throat> I mean, the way that theory worked at the time was you calculate a partition function by summing over all states, use random walk statistics, and there's no way to distinguish one type of knot from another when you do that. And yet clearly topologically they're distinct, so those states aren't accessible from each other, so there's an ergodicity problem. And um, it's essentially an uncontrolled approximation. And I wanted to understand where there are physical consequences to that. And, and that's what I was most interested in. Those experiments I didn't do until I was a professor at Caltech, but I did all in the theory as a, as a student. Um, the ones that I was doing experiments for were more simple questions about polymer dynamics um, and, and, uh, and testing the theories of polymer dynamics that have been developed by Sam Edwards and others. Um, and I kind of uh, extended those theories, then went to the experiments to test them at Stanford. Now, going back to Steve Chu's lab from Oxford, did you ever think about simply transferring and finishing your graduate work at Stanford? I did. I thought about doing two PhDs, actually, one in theory and one experiment. And then, you know, I kind of woke up and said, nobody needs more than one PhD. It's a terminal degree. <laughs> and my career will go faster and I'll get paid more if I just, you know, become a postdoc instead of you get tired of being a student after a while. All right, higher salary, I'll do the postdoc and then, you know, try to move along that way. By the time you defended, were you looking at faculty positions and postdocs at the same time? No, nobody would hire me. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a three-year degree at Oxford. You know, it's hard to be competitive um, against American students who have five years. And, um, you know, nobody was going to give me a faculty position. I was going to have to scrounge for postdocs. But I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to go back to Steve and continue the work. So I went back to Stanford and he was nice enough to take me in. What aspects of your postdoc were a continuation of graduate school and where were there new opportunities for research? So I wanted to keep doing these experiments to test theories of dynamics and do better versions of them that were closer to fluctuations about equilibrium. The ones I had originated the first round are super far from equilibrium and looking at those properties, how Palmas return from a long way out. And what I did as a postdoc was then just look at 
fluctuations about equilibrium and measure them and test some theories about normal mode decomposition and hydrodynamic coupling along the polymer. What was the timing? Where were you when Steve won the Nobel Prize in 1997? I was at Caltech as assistant professor. And, you know, the pressure was enormous to get him to come. Everybody wanted him. Everybody knew I'd work for him. And they said, Steve, Steve, you got to get Steve Chu to come. And so I got a hold of him. I twisted his arm, got him to come down. It was one of the first talks after the Nobel Prize. And I had to do the introduction and to the lecture. And, you know, there were like a couple hundred people there in the auditorium. Like everybody showed up. And I got up. I gave the introduction. And, you know, before I gave the introduction, like, a wave of nervousness swept over me, very unusual. I just became very nervous. I, I got through it, gave the introduction. I went and sat down and everyone had turned and looked at me. And I was like, oh shit, what happened? I thought back, I realized in my nervousness, I forgot to say, he just won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> now as so a I said, oh yeah, he won the Nobel Prize this year. <laughs> now, as a, either a graduate student or a postdoc, or maybe even as an undergrad, did you feel the buzz? Did you see the significance of where this research was headed? Oh, everybody knew that, yeah, he was on a good trajectory for that. And the work he was doing in laser cooling and trapping was um, so important that, you know, there was a decent chance um, he'd get the call from Stockholm. How long did you stay in his lab as a postdoc? Two years. 94 to 96. And at that point, what options were you considering? You know, I had a couple of job offers. I mean, the two that were serious were Rice and Caltech. And, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, I wasn't like the most distinguished candidate because I'd done this three-year doctorate, two-year postdoc, didn't have that many papers. But Tom Tumbrello um, at Caltech, uh, who was a character, um, sadly passed away now, um, he, I owe it to him that I got to Caltech. He had somehow convinced the powers to be at Caltech to let him run a search ad every year, even though he had no billets or positions to hire people. And he would run a little virtual search committee and anybody that applied to this thing that he thought was interesting, he would try to match make them with an existing search or another department. So he was like this you know, quality control filter, a talent scout was trying to find people how licensed to do that. And you know, I had applied to his thing. He liked what he saw. He got me down there and plugged me into the applied physics search and basically helped me get that job. So you, which I'm eternally grateful. You came in as a physics hire, not a biology applied hire. Physics. Applied physics. Applied physics, and that's that's in EAS, the division yeah. of. Yeah, that's EAS. You know that I have a theory about a university that has a department of physics and a department of applied physics. Yeah, what's that? that what's that? That means that sometime in the past, there were two physics faculty members who couldn't get along with each other and they had to be separated <laughs> into different departments. And, uh, you know, at Stanford, which has the same thing, it was Ginson and Variant. They just couldn't get along. They had to be put in different places. At Caltech, the problem was that Gelman would not allow any solid state physicists to be hired. He called it squalid state. Right. So applied physics was established to hire solid state physicists at Caltech and get somebody working in that field. Now, you're higher at Caltech. You mentioned how, you know, the, the, the Feynman book really resonated with you. Had, had Caltech professors loomed large in your education? Did you have an appreciation for what, what kind of research had occurred at Caltech over the years? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's such a legendary place. Um, uh, you know, not just Feynman, but Pauling, right? I mean, just everybody knew about that. Um, uh, in physics, Gilman, I mean, the whole cohort of folks there was amazing. Um, you know, in biology, Delbrook and Benzer, just incredible names, and the list went on and on. So, yeah, it was a place, I mean, when I was attracted to it, it just had such amazing history of exquisite, wonderful scientists. I've come to appreciate the unique way that Caltech supports its junior faculty. I wonder if you could speak to that. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'm an example of that, that, you know, they came, plucked me out, took a chance on me and, and helped nurture my career, um, largely by leaving me alone. Uh, but as I said, key senior faculty went out of the way to help me get connected to certain grants or postdocs or whatever, and, you know, uh, made sure I had the tools I needed to succeed. 
um, and had great collaborations. You know, they tell assistant professors not to collaborate because with senior people because you won't get promoted. But I ignored that, and it worked out just fine. You know, Axel Scherer and I had great collaborations. We did a ton of stuff together, um, and uh, you know, it, it was really marvelous. Frances Arnold and I did a bunch of stuff together. She was one of my mentors. Axel and Francis were my two biggest mentors there at Caltech, I think, um, that I worked closely with. Um, Terry Bahala in the department, I think, who chaired the search committee and then got me promoted. Th those were the ones. Talking Francis, about- Francis, I think, both cited papers with me. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Talking yeah. about new tools, the opportunity to build your own lab, what was most important to you, both in terms of instrumentation and your overall science objectives at that point? Well, I knew it had to be had both wet bench biology and physics. And, you know, I was stronger as a physicist then. I was kind of learning my way around biology, but not, not really confident in it. And so <clears throat> I was at Stanford as a postdoc. I went to the biochemistry department where we had been, you know, assigned a bench to work with to, to do our pipetting. I took out a ruler and I measured everything. And I said, this is what I want. Just clone this. I measured the benches, the shelves, da, 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 da. Make me a version of this, um, which they did. Uh, and, uh, you know, the physics part, I knew I just needed rooms with certain vibration, isolation, laser tables, blah, 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 blah. We got all that going. That was, I was more comfortable with that at that point. And what were some of the big research projects as you got your lab up and running? Well, when I started, um, I continued to work, work on optical tweezers on single molecules. So we built next generation optical tweezers, began using them to measure uh, more aspects of hydrodynamic interaction between beads and polymers, used to tie DNA into a knot, several things like that. Um, began also getting interested in microfabrication. So the microfluidic stuff, I had gotten started because my postdoc office mate a um, guy named Wayne Volkmuth, who had done his PhD with Bob Austin at Princeton, had built microfabricated sieving devices to do electrophoresis. And I thought that was super interesting. And I got him to teach me how to do that. We used to sneak into the fab lab at Stanford on weekends. He taught me how to do lithography. Um, and so I knew I wanted to do that at Caltech. And that was why I began collaborating with Axel, because he had all lithography equipment. And uh, uh, we mentored a joint student together in Hopu Chu. Um, who began making devices we wanted to use to make two-dimensional DNA and to, uh, and to make a DNA flow cytometer. Um, and, and that was sort of I got started doing the microfluidics stuff. Tell me about the field of microfluidics and why it was so interesting to you at that point. Yeah, I wanted to uh, find ways to automate biology. I mean, I looked at biology and it was so labor intensive, lots of people pipetting all day. Um, and I thought, I don't want to group a lot of people just by petting all day. We'll invent machines to do that for us. And then that'll let us scale. We'll need a bigger group and it'll be more powerful. And so I got interested in trying to develop the integrated circuit for biology. Um, and, you know, what would that mean? And what it meant was plumbing and automating plumbing. And, you know, there's a little bit of literature out there, people trying to do things, but it was very primitive and nobody had really solved the problems, the outstanding problems. And, we managed to be the ones to do that um, in my group. And we invented the first microfluidic valve that could be built at scale um, with thousands of valves on a chip. Um, and we call that microfluidic large scale integration. Uh, and you know that kind of really revolutionized the field. Now your collaborations with Axel and Francis, were you specifically looking at the kinds of things that they were doing and there was a point of inspiration were you sort of like co-equals based on your own expertise? They always treated me as an equal. Yep. They always did. Now you mentioned it was at Caltech that your entrepreneurial side really blossomed. How did that come about? What did you see as an opportunity there? Well, it started with the microfluidic devices and we decided to make a company to try to commercialize them. And uh, I found the CEO who is an old college classmate of mine and Larry Gilbert found us the first investor. It was someone he had been cultivating, um, a guy named Bruce Burroughs. And he introduced us to Bruce. Bruce wrote us our first check and got the company financed. And um, that turned into Fluidon, which became a public company, market cap more than a billion dollars at some point, and became the leading microfluidic company in the world. Is it still in existence? 
It is, although they changed the name to Standard Biotools last year. Are you still involved at any level? I'm not. No, I, I stopped being involved a number of years ago. We, we founded that in 1999. <laughs> so many biotech companies, you know, they start out promising and then they flame out. What do you think the secret to the success of this was? Well, we had great leadership. The CEO, Gaius Worthington, he led the company for 20 years um, and, you know, really built it to last um, and did a great job. Um, and also we had great technology. You know, it really was revolutionary and that allowed them to build unique products. Steve, I wonder if you could explain if there was a particular moment where you really appreciated the, the, the symbiotic relationship between fundamental research, the kinds of questions that you were after, and building the tools necessary to answer them. If there was a particular moment where that really became apparent to you. Well, I mean, there was a number of those. I mean, one was when we invented the valves, we were thinking this, this is a technology I have a lot of uses and we don't know what the use is gonna be yet, but we knew it was gonna be interesting and useful and we believed it. And I had just gotten the Packard Fellowship and I was up there at the Packard meeting and I gave it to talk. I said, here's some cool videos. We just invented these valves and this plumbing and I think it's gonna be useful for something. And I'm gonna spend a few years figuring that out. One of the other Packard fellows in the audience was a Berkeley professor named James Berger. And he approached me afterward and he said, you should use this for protein crystallization to solve protein structures because it's a challenging problem. You gotta do a lot of experiments. The protein is hard to get and it's a great thing to miniaturize and automate. And so I said, huh, went back to Caltech, started doing some calculations um, thought, huh, this could work. I had a young graduate student named Carl Hansen who was just ready to join the lab. And I said, Carl, why don't you work on this? The numbers look like it's going to work. Let's, let's try to grow protein crystals in the chips. And Carl did a bunch of work on that, turned into uh, a really cool tool. Um, he figured out how to grow crystals on chip. And then I sent it off to James's lab for a week. Um, and in a week, he did more experiments than James's best graduate student did in a year. At that point, I knew we were onto something. Um, and that became Fluid Adam's first product. They licensed that and they built that and they launched a whole product, a number of innovative structures solved using that. And it was a great example of that sort of interplay. I wonder if you could just explain, what does it mean to grow a crystal on a chip? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, at that point in time, the primary method to determine protein structure was through X-ray crystallography. And so if you wanted to um, do that, you had to have a crystal. The proteins all had to be grown in a crystal where the order was the same, so they would diffract the X-rays um, uh, and, and make diffraction patterns in, in a coherent way. Um, and uh, there was no way to predict crystallization conditions. It required a lot of brute force experimentation. Um, of finding the right combination of salts and buffers that would cause the proteins to grow as a crystal and not just sort of crash into a disordered mess and condensed. And very interesting physics of the phases of that that we were able to explore and work out. Um, uh, and that's the thing, it's like growing rock candy, right? That's a crystal of sugar. That's what you had to do with proteins in order to get their structures. Now, did you see this in some ways as an entree into human health science for you? Yes, I mean, some of the proteins that were the structure was determined was so they could be either developed as therapeutics or turned into, uh, 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 or, or gotten structures with, with therapeutics bound to them, understanding how to design small molecules to bind to them. Do you have a specific memory of when computation really became a game changer in the lab for you? Um, really, as we got into genomics and sequencing, when I was up at Stanford, that was when it really cranked up because the sequencers were throwing off so much information and how you computed on that and calculated with it was, was, uh, was, became central. Tell me about your decision to move to Stanford, especially after receiving tenure at Caltech. Yeah, well. You know, that was one of the hardest decisions I made in my career, probably the hardest. I loved Caltech. Um, I fit in there. They treated me incredibly well. I was probably one of the youngest full professors they ever had. Um, and uh, what happened was Steve Chu began to recruit me back. 
Um, and there was a new department being formed in bioengineering. So there's an opportunity to start a new department and hire two dozen faculty members. And at a place of Stanford's caliber, that doesn't happen very often. I figured it'd be a once in a career opportunity. Also, my wife preferred the Bay Area over LA. She never found her niche in LA, so she was eager to go back. And so it was those two things that drove it. But you know, I didn't sleep for two weeks trying to make my mind up on that. And uh, you know, I have to say that I spent almost a decade at Caltech. I spent almost two decades at Stanford. I still identify more with Caltech. It was such a formative experience. And frankly, I fit in better because I'm a kind of an oddball. And Caltech is much more tolerant of oddballs than a place like Stanford. Um, and you know, it, it was you know such a wonderful part of my career. Now. Influencing this decision, I'm curious, were there already discussions with people like YC Tai about creating a medical engineering program at Caltech? Were those already in, in train when you were making this, this oh, decision? Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, well, I'll tell you a story about YC. Um, you know, he was the guy in microfabrication when I got there, right? And, you know, he, was, he had this gigantic engine of a lab that was just cranking stuff out. And uh, I was trying to just scrap and get things started. And, you know, I went to go see him. I said, do you have any used equipment you don't want anymore? I'll take anything you've got that you're not using. <laughs> and uh, he offered me some, uh, some, you know, really aged equipment, which I took and was grateful for. Um, but I think he, he, he appreciated the chutzpah and the <laughs> entrepreneurial sense of that. And uh, he told me later that somebody was worried I wasn't getting mentored enough. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. But uh, uh, he told him, don't worry about Steve. He's okay. <laughs> <laughs> now tell me about the, yeah, uh, the mentoring. I, mentoring. Well, I mean, applied physics hadn't hired anybody for a decade. I mean, really, I was the first person. They had forgotten. And there's a small department. And there was no mentoring. I mean, the secretaries are my mentors. They were the ones who taught me how to write grant proposals. Um, you know, they took me under their wing and showed me all the ropes. And if it weren't for them, I never would have got it going. Um, and I have to laugh. I look today at, at all the structure and mentoring for young faculty, and I'm a little bit of curmudgeon and say, that's not how it was back in the day. <laughs> now, do you have a sense of the, the origin story of the bioengineering initiative yeah. at Stanford? Yeah, that was Maury Garib. So Maury Garib really wanted to do that. He had moved from UCSD and he wanted to create a bioengineering program at Caltech. And he recruited me and Paul Sternberg. And the three of us were kind of the founding group of bioengineering at Caltech. And if you look back, there's like an interview with us in one of the Caltech magazines um, and where we talk about it. And we kind of got the curriculum and the whole program off the ground um, a couple of years before I left for Stanford. Now, at Stanford, this new initiative there in bioengineering, how did that get started? Well, there had been a bunch of false starts um, over the years where Stanford had tried to do bioengineering. And they tried to do it out of the mechanical engineering department. They tried to do it in the chemical engineering department. None of those guys really had the right vision to generate enthusiasm in the administration. And finally, we had two deans, um, uh, Jim Plummer and Phil Pizzo. Jim was the Dean of Engineering, Phil was the Dean of Medicine. And they decided that they wanted this to be part of their legacy to start a new department of bioengineering. And it would be joint between engineering and medicine. And it would be de novo, not derived from an existing department. And they got John Hennessy to buy into this and to commit a lot of resources to it. Um, and uh, they pulled in Scott Delp to be the founding chair. Um, he was a mechanical engineering professor at that point, but he had been at a bioengineering department in, in Northwestern before Stanford and uh, got him to be the leader. And he's the one who recruited me um, to the department. And you said this was just simply too exciting to pass up, along with the fact that your wife was more comfortable yeah. there. Yeah. Tell me what made it work so well after these false starts. Well... Well, I mean, part of it was that it was de novo. And so, and part of it was Scott's vision and the other faculty he got involved in it, that all these faculty were willing to put aside their kind of parochial self-interest of what they were researching and say, we want to do something new and interesting and get people in working on new frontiers. And so the first search, they hired no engineers. They hired a physicist, a psychiatrist, and a chemist. Those are the first three faculty in bioengineering at Stanford. <laughs> that took guts. 
All right. Yeah. That took guts. And it's done very well. You know, my program took off, was very successful. The psychiatrist was a guy named Carl Dyseroff, um, who invented optogenetics and was Viviana Gradinaro's mentor. Uh, she's Caltech faculty mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. He's won a ton of prizes. He'll probably win a Nobel Prize. That's a matter of time. And the chemist was Jennifer Cochran, who's gone on to do great things as well. Found a number of companies. She just served as a department chair um, and been just an awesome colleague. Um, so, you know, it started with a very diverse set of people. Um, and we managed to maintain that spirit as we hired and grew in the department. Now, as you explained, letting go of some of your parochial interest in, in coming back to Stanford, how did that change your research agenda? What aspects did you take with you from Caltech? What did you take on anew? Well, you know, it seemed to me the opportunity, research opportunity at Stanford, was to work with a great cell biologist. My research, I could tell, was moving from molecules to cells. And I wanted to understand cells and work with them. And, uh, you know, Stanford had a very deep bench of great cell biologists. I thought, I'm going to collaborate with those folks. Irv Weissman, Stem Cell Institute, and it kind of went on and on and on. And that all came to pass. That you know, it was awesome. We did a lot of wonderful things together. Um, and it was everything I hoped it would be. What I didn't anticipate was how much fun I would have with the clinicians. We got a hospital, a medical school here. And, you know, as we got into these diagnostic tools, using genomics to do these diagnostics, it, that all happened because of the ability to work with the clinicians here and do these clinical studies. And I had no idea that was coming. That totally changed the course of my research um, and been a ton of fun. Why was it so fun after not really knowing to expect it? You know, because I put in my career, everything I'd done, these were very direct, immediate applications. You know, like when we, the first big diagnostic we did was to replace amniocentesis with a blood test. And, uh, you know, when that paper came out, it was like, I was a hero all the moms in the neighborhood, right? It hit the popular press. Everyone was like, wow, it's amazing what you're doing. That never happened when I was doing papers about polymers. <laughs> <laughs> People appreciate it a lot more. Let's put it that way, the, the lay public. Now, how the, the, the issue of amniocentesis, how did you come to that specifically to tackle that problem? Well, that was through my own experience becoming a parent. Um, you know, we uh, had our our first kid when I was at Caltech, uh, my daughter, Zoe, and, you know, uh, we were seeing the OB um, down at, uh, uh, he worked at the Huntington Hospital, so it was near there in South Pass, and he was very well regarded OB, and my, my wife, he was a great doctor, and my wife, he told us in one of the visits, well, you're of the age, you should probably get amnio, check for genetic defects, and just something you want to do. And we looked at each other and thought it was kind of a theoretical question, like, you know, there'd be a follow-up appointment or something. And we were like, yeah, that sounds right. And he turned around with a gigantic needle in his hand and plunged it right in her belly, did the amnio himself right there. And we were just freaked out by that, right? And, you know, it, there's risk associated with it. It made a huge impression on me that why would you risk your baby's life to ask a diagnostic question? That didn't make any sense. And that's what got me thinking about that. And it was years later at Stanford that I kind of cottoned on to the way to solve that problem. And did you immediately appreciate that it would be blood test? That would be the way around invasive procedures? I mean, that was the, the, the kind of light bulb that went off that, you know, I discovered there was this literature about cell-free DNA, that there was DNA from all the tissues in your body, including the fetus in your blood. Um, and so there's a way to get at the genetics of the fetus from a blood test. That had been known since the late 1940s, and nobody had ever managed to turn into a practical test uh, until we did. So that, you know, it begs the question, if we're all significant discovery, it seems so obvious only in retrospect. Do you have any insight why it took so long and why it took to you to make this connection? Yeah, I mean, part of it was this was an obscure phenomenon. And, you know, I think most people weren't making the, and people were, there was a small, very small community working on it of, of, you know, people that, you know, it was moving at a snail's pace. And it also needed technological innovation. I mean, a key insight was to figure out how to count molecules. 
and none of the pathologists or doctor types who are working in that field were thinking along those lines. And it took an outsider like me who had been counting molecules through the single molecule experiments and then thinking about the sequencer as a way to count molecules to really get at the answer. Steve, one big difference, I wonder, between um, medical devices, drug delivery, and a blood diagnostic test, what's the regulatory mechanism for bringing this concept to, to, to a clinical environment? Yeah, I mean, diagnostics in this country, the U.S., um, there's something called CLIA, uh, which is an association that certifies testing labs. And so you've got to get certified by them to have a test. Um, and, you know, interestingly, it doesn't need FDA approval. Um, but if you can get CLIA certified and you can get the doctors to recommend it, which usually means working with the doctor professional organizations, um, you can develop commercial diagnostic. Um, FDA approval is useful in cases around reimbursement. People usually get that in the end, but you don't need it at the beginning. What partners did you need in order to make this a viable commercial project? Well, I mean, let's start with the, the viable research project. And, you know, I partnered with doctors here at Stanford who began recruiting women and collecting their blood and doing the amnio separately so that we could have something to compare with. Um, and, you know, without them, we wouldn't be able to do this. So there's a great collaboration there with the Maternal Fetal Medicine Group here at Stanford. And then once we published the paper, um, one needed to, we had a very small study, just proof of principle, two dozen women. Um, but it was obvious, we proved the principle. But to really get the clinical use, you have to do a much larger cohort. There's other questions you have to answer um, that are important. And so, you know, we weren't in a position to do like a thousand women study or several thousand women study at Stanford. And so the patent was licensed to a company that raised the money, did the study. Um, it was called Veronata. Uh, and they, uh, they brought the test to market after that study. And what, what has come of the company since? So Veronata was acquired by Illumina. Um, and they've now licensed it very broadly on their sequencers. And, you know, there's multiple companies in the space all using more or less some version of what we developed or a derivative of it. And now like 8 million women a year get some version of this test. Now, is there any case to be made that there's some clinical or diagnostic value of amnio for which a blood test cannot be relevant? Or does the blood test really replace everything? Well, it depends who you ask. Um, you know, I think the blood test is on its way to replacing everything. Um, the performance is nearly as good as amnio. Um, so good that I wouldn't take the risk of an amnio, really. I would say I have really good reasons for it. It's hard to find those. There are certain very rare things that you can find with an amnio, but they're so rare. No sane person would risk their baby to test for it. Um, <clears throat> so right now, amnios are used to sort of verify after the blood test, and eventually that's going to become obsolete because I think confidence in the blood test and the performance is just going to keep growing over time. Now, just as a matter of intellectual curiosity, is this what got you into thinking about blood tests replacing biopsies? Would the amnio work? Yeah, yeah, because the amnio is a biopsy, right? I mean, it's essentially like a biopsy. You're grabbing a fetal cell um, out of the womb there. And what, what other kinds of procedures were, were most interesting to you that you can tackle the same approach? Well, after we published the first paper on the non-invasive prenatal testing, uh, I got a call from a colleague at Stanford named Hannah Valentine, who's a cardiologist. And she said, Steve, I saw your paper. We have a similar problem for heart transplant patients. We biopsy them every couple of months after the transplant, to see if the heart is being rejected and to, to, and to adjust their immunosuppressant drugs. But the patients hate it and it's painful. And is there a version of what you did that will work for this? And we got together to talk about it, and I realized there was. Um, so we developed that together, and uh, that became Care DX's test, which now hundreds of thousands of people get every year. So the obvious question here with this trajectory, do you envision a system where biopsies in their entirety are replaced by blood tests? That would be great. That'd be a great thing. I mean, we're trying to knock them off one by one. I'm not sure you'll ever get rid of all of them, but... I think we're going to be able to knock down their usage enormously. What do you see in terms of the role of advances in imaging technology as another way to reduce the incidence, the, the need for biopsies? Yeah, I mean, there was a big push in pregnancy to use imaging and blood tests of protein markers to replace amnio, but it didn't work very well. Um, 
In imaging, I mean, in pregnancy, there are certain congenital things you can detect um, that can be surgically repaired, and ultrasound is good for that um, sort of detection. Um, there are, you know, imaging is still a powerful way to do certain things. Like, I mean, it works together, um, like in cancer. There's now a very strong effort being successful to use the techniques we developed in pregnancy in cancer for early cancer detection. Um, and if you get a positive on that, you've got to go find where the tumor is. That means doing imaging. Um, and so that's, those are paired together very well, imaging to follow up positive tests for cancer, for example. Steve, tell me about the value of being an investigator for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. What, what, was, what was the advantage for you there? Oh, that was terrific. You know, I spent 10 years in that program and uh, uh, it, it, you know, first of all, provides, you know, essentially unrestricted funds for research. You can do whatever you want. Um, and, you know, I went to whatever I wanted, <laughs> including a bunch of this diagnostic stuff that I wasn't funded for and including a bunch of using micropolitics for single cell genomics, which I wasn't funded for. <laughs> um, and, it also, you know, introduced me to a lot of great biologists. You had to go to one meeting a year, and everyone had to give a 20-minute presentation. And everyone brought their A game. I mean, really, their best science. There were a lot of great scientists that were part of it. And I just learned a ton of biology listening to those talks um, and meeting that community. It was really, really good. Is there a time, uh, a specific end to the program? Can you renew it? Yeah, you could renew on a five-year cycle, um, and I renewed once, and then the next time I was going to renew again, but uh, I got offered the opportunity to lead the Biohub, and so I stepped down to do that. Now, before we get to the Biohub, just sort of an overall question, the Human Genome Project, were you involved with it over the years? I was not, not directly. I mean, I received some NIH funding for technology development, um, but I wasn't part of sequencing the human genome. Um, that, that was, you know, um, a little, how to say, a little ahead of my involvement in the field. And your overall contributions and interest in genomics, were you a beneficiary of the findings of the Human Genome Project? Absolutely. I mean, the whole prenatal test used the human genome reference because the way it works is you sequence random snippets of DNA and then map them back to the genome to understand what chromosome they came from. Um, so we needed the reference genome for that. And I would argue is really the first clinical application of the human genome was our NIPT work. I'm curious what a scale. Um, I'm, I'm curious what aspects of the human genome project you see as complete and in what ways this is prelude for the next phase of the project. Well, um, you know, in roughly 2000, the two efforts, um, created a draft human genome. Um, and 20 years after that, we're finally getting it to be more or less complete. Um, but there's a lot of subtlety around it. Um, and you know, I'd also say that the initial efforts um, were very expensive. I mean, it was a billion, couple billion dollars to get the first human genome draft done. So that's not enabling a personal genomes. So there had been a huge, huge wave of effort in developing so-called next generation sequencing technologies, which allowed resequencing of human genomes um, using the reference as a, as a scaffold. Um, and that's the part where I got involved. Now, when the opportunity to, to become co-president of the Biohub came about, who found you? What was the initial point of contact? Well, I was asked by John Hennessy, who was then the president of Stanford, to serve on the committee to make a proposal to Mark and Priscilla. So Mark and Priscilla let me know they wanted to do a research institute in the Bay Area involving UCSF and Stanford. I was on a planning committee. Um, and I did a bunch of work on that. And through that, I got asked to be one of the leaders. Did you get a sense in your interactions with Mark and Priscilla what their vision was, what they hoped to do with their, their generosity? Yeah, and that's definitely evolved over time. But, you know, I think, you know, Priscilla, is a pediatrician, uh, a doctor, and uh, Mark is a, one of the great technologists of our time. And they wanted to combine those two interests and you know, fun things that would be technology driving science to improve human health. 
Um, that, that was really their vision. Um, and they've, they've stayed faithful to that over the years I've worked with them. In terms of siting, in terms of building the, the headquarters for the, for the Biohub, what were the considerations relative to proximity to Stanford, for example? Well, I mean, that's a funny story. Um, so my first meeting with Mark, um, I, he sent me an email out of the blue. Why don't you come by the house? Let's have a chat. That's when he was interviewing me to, to, to be the, the leader. And uh, I went to the house and we kind of chatted a little bit. And at one point I said, you know, if you really want to do something for the Bay Area, you've got to include Berkeley too, um, because they got great engineering, great basic science, and uh, it would be crazy to leave them out. So it shouldn't just be Stanford and UCSF. I said, okay. I don't think my Stanford colleagues ever forgave me for that. <laughs> um, but it ended up being really important. And so in choosing the site, we decided to pick something that was in Mission Bay, equidistant from Stanford and, UC and from Berkeley, easy to get to from both, and sort of equidistant from the, uh, uh, the original UCSF campus. And was the founding vision that, that the Biohub would, would have professors with joint appointments at a university, or would there be fully uh, employed scientists at the Biohub exclusively? Yeah, we decided um, to employ scientists at the Biohub and that the professors we were gonna fund, we would do that through gifts and not take them out of their labs. We didn't wanna disrupt the fabric of the university departments. So we decided all the space we had would be filled with our own employees. And we'd ask the professors to come in uh, once or twice a month to come to seminars and share their research, but to keep their research efforts in their own labs and departments. Now, did the Biohub have a clinical environment from the beginning? Did it need to have a hospital affiliation? Um, well, in order to satisfy the tax laws, we have to have a hospital affiliation to be a medical research organization. So we had that affiliation with the hospitals, but we weren't doing clinical or translational research, really. I mean, basic science. And was there a particular kind of basic science that was sort of the foundation, the intellectual foundation for the Biohub? Yes. I mean, Mark and Priscilla and, you know, Joe and I, we kind of hatched this vision that we could bring together great universities to take on a big scientific problem they wouldn't do otherwise. And the Biohub would be the, the fulcrum for that. Um, and so in my case, I wanted to make cell atlases. And so one of the first big projects of the Biohub was to build these cell atlases of human, mouse, fly, and so forth. And this was like big science. We had dozens of labs from the universities involved with the collaboration. We had a big part of the Biohub team working on it. Um, and these papers had like 150, 160 authors on them. And we managed to quarterback all that with the resources of the Biohub. Now, I'm sure it's an obvious question, but still, why does building a cell atlas require a big science approach? Well, it, you know, it requires a lot of expertise because all these tissues are different. And, uh, you know, we, we wanted to have people with domain expertise on each tissue to make sure the experiments were done right and that the analysis and annotation was done right. Um, and then there was just a lot of back end sequencing and data analysis needed, which we could do with the Biohub infrastructure. Has it been enjoyable using the Biohub as a point of interaction with colleagues at UC San Francisco and Berkeley in, in, in collaborations that might not otherwise exist? It's been great. It's been great. And there are many examples of that. Um, and, you know, it's, um, it's something we're all very proud of. Now, you said that Mark and Priscilla's, their vision for the Biohub has changed over the years. In what ways? In, you know, I think the Biohub vision has stayed similar. This idea of bring three universities together, solve a big problem. But I think they're, their science philanthropy, I mean, the, the broad outlines have stayed the same, but they have acquired, I mean, you know, their own sense of taste and judgment for the things they like to fund. And um, it's been awesome to see that. Um, you know, they can both converse at length about anything we're doing at the Biohub or we're grant funding wise at CZI or Imaging Institute, you name it. Was there any analog to the Biohub? Did you, or Mark Priscilla, did anybody look at other organizations? Or was this, as you say, with, the, with, with Stanford Bioengineering, really a de novo enterprise? I mean, it was a de novo enterprise, but you know, we sought input and guidance. I mean, we talked to Bob Tijan, who had been the president of HHMI and had Janelia Farm under his belt there. And he was a very close advisor early on. 
called up Eric Lander, talked to him about what it was like to start the Broad. Um, and, you know, what he learned from that, what we do differently. And so, yes, we were talking to other people out there about the lessons learned and trying to um, not make the same mistakes that they made, rather than make our, our own mistakes. <laughs> Given the size of the endowment, all of the resources, I wonder if you could talk about some of the, the challenges in establishing parameters that, you know, there do need to be limits on the kinds of things the Biohub gets involved in. Yeah, well, we had a finite budget from the beginning. And, you know, we spent a lot of time talking to Mark and Priscilla about how that should be allocated. And, um, yeah, I mean, we're very conscious that we can't do everything. You know, you can't boil the ocean. This has been something Mark and Priscilla learned, I think, as well, that, you know, in their experience, not just with the Biohub, but with grant giving, that, you know, it's pretty straightforward to fund good science. That's not that difficult. But that also feels like boiling the ocean. And they wanted to focus on a smaller number of deeply inspirational big projects. Um, that, that's definitely something in their thinking that evolved. So among those deeply inspirational big projects, what do you count as some of the successes with the full appreciation that these things have very long time scales and you're right in the middle of it? Well, the Cell Atlas stuff has been great. I mean, you know, prototypical example of what a philanthropy should do to open up a field. Um, and uh, that's been awesome. The work that CCI that funded um, some of the innovations of electron microscopy that led to the founding of the Imaging Institute, I have high hopes that that's going to lead to some really revolutionary advances in cryo-electron microscopy for structure determination. Um, right now, the resolution revolution of, on the detector side has been just awesome for determining individual structures, and the next generation of technologies is going to allow us to image proteins directly in cells, um, in the milieu of cells, and that's going to reveal a whole other set of interesting biology. Do you see the Biohub as retaining its, its commitment to basic science completely, or is there evolution in the works to make the Biohub more translational at some point? Time will tell. We're doing it in 10-year chunks, and you know we've got a, a big horizon. So on that basis, what would be the, you know, given that it's, 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 a, it's a basic science organization now, all of the discovery that's happening there, what's a logical place for it to go to from the biohub? Is it, is, it, is it an Amgen? Is it back to the universities? Where do those ideas go? We take an approach very similar to the universities. We license it out. Um, and you know, whether it's big company, small company, um, we have very similar licensing policies to what universities do. Steve, I... And with that, yeah, maybe this would be a good time to pause and then pick it up on the next one. Would that be okay? Yeah, that'd be fine. We'll pick it up then. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dave. This is a lot of fun. I'll see you next time. We should we should get back.